Hello and welcome to the Kaspersky Lab offices here in London. My name's David McClelland and today we're going to be talking about the news headlines. Not a day goes by, it seems, without some high-profile data or security breach, but this is no longer the stuff of IT trade magazines. Today we're asking how businesses should respond to this. Should businesses bury their head in the sand and say, it'll never happen to us, or maybe they should take a more proactive approach? Joining me to discuss this and more, I'm delighted to be joined by Oleg Gorobets, who is the Head of Technology Positioning at Kaspersky Lab, and also Dave Messit, who is European Product Marketing Manager for Kaspersky Lab. We've been hearing about a lot of high-profile uh, data breaches. What's at stake here? First and foremost, what's at stake is money. The cyber criminals, typically their, their primary motivation is profit. They're looking to steal some kind of saleable asset like intellectual property, company secrets. Whilst you can equate the amount that, that a cyber criminal steals with the amount of money that an enterprise may lose, the reality is that for enterprises the costs go way beyond that because then they have to start looking at the costs of remediating the problem, potentially loss of business, the cost of downtime and their staff uh, being unproductive for a period of time. Uh, they may be looking at harder to quantify costs like the loss of reputation or even financial penalties from you know, the regulatory authority. This is where the, the financial losses almost take, take two paths. There's the loss right now, your operational loss, but then there's also the, the losses in the future as well, isn't there, really? Yeah, the first one it could, could probably be loss of competitive advantage. You are almost there in securing some very important contract, but suddenly, at the last moment, your rival, your competitor got it. How? By obtaining the particular details about it, by offering the exactly the thing your client would like you to have. And all because you were unable to secure the data about your contract. I guess reputational damage is very difficult, particularly in a highly competitive marketplace. Put a value on that, isn't it? It is, and that's one of the, of the challenges we can quantify by asking the customers themselves. And some research that we've done recently suggests that the average cost to an enterprise of a, a cyber incident is in the region of 600 to $650,000. Let's have a look then at today's threat landscape. How would you classify where we are right now? Well, we still have lots of threats that can be considered quite common. Types of malware that are out there, it is well known to security vendors. They may be simple, they are thrown widely uh, in hope that they will hit someone and bring some profit. Despite their simplicity, they still can be working because the majority of people still underestimate the value of security. If you put enough effort into it, if you put a decent security solution and uh, efficient security policies in place, this risk can be easily mitigated, but still many people fail to do this. Many businesses fail to do this. Of the overall threats, uh, attacks that we're seeing, what percentage would you say that is? Uh, that is around 70%. Known threats, they are known to the industry, this can be countered. 70% of these threats are known known. Known malware, yeah. yeah. Should be preventable by companies that are yes, yes. Uh, stringent about, about how they deal with their security. Abs now. Exactly. Yeah, so the interesting thing about that 70% is that about 99% of the 70, we know from our research, using vulnerabilities for which a patch has already been issued by the appropriate software vendor. So for a company that regularly updates all of their security patches across all of their software, they can take that 70% down to less than 1%. They can just eradicate the other 69 and a bit out of the picture entirely just by having a 
a sensible and automated patch management solution. OK, what about the remaining 30% then? Well, the remaining 30% is a little more difficult, <laughs> right? So, by definition, the fact that it is not in the known bucket means it's either unknown or is advanced. Let me talk about the unknown piece. That is using what's typically uh, known as zero-day uh, vulnerability. That is a vulnerability that is not yet known about, that a cyber criminal has identified and found a way to exploit, but that none of the security vendors, the, uh, the people who originally wrote that application, are unaware that, that that vulnerability exists. We have to start using more proactive techniques and technologies, things like heuristic algorithms, things like behavioural analysis where we monitor what an application is doing, what, what's being run on a particular system, and if, if we can identify the types of behaviour that are indicative of malware, indicative of an exploit at work, then we can start to remove the restrictions that that, that application has and prevent it from, for example, writing to the, the system registry. Tell me about this remaining 1%, these advanced threats, Oleg. OK, they are just that, uh, more advanced. What does it mean? Uh, first of all, uh, their level of sophistication is much greater. Their number of tricks they are employing to evade detection is much bigger. They are more, much more advanced. What really differs them from all the others is their targeted because uh, these are attacks that are being actively directed by living persons with a very pronounced targeting in their minds. They understand what are they doing, against who they are doing that, and which secrets, which parts of information they would like to get from their attacks. The attackers are trying to know as much about their targets as it is possible to understand where their vulnerabilities are. Where is that weak spot they need to hit to attain their goals? And after that, they need to prepare a particular tool set that could be leveraging that vulnerabilities. And that would include an extensive amount of testing so they would try to simulate the security system they are going to attack. That gives them extra edge in their well, advances. When we talk about advanced threats, yeah. what's the difference between those and APTs or advanced persistent threats? The persistent part, it's because the tool sets of these attackers can persist for months and years without being detected. Sometimes they just, just go dormant until the new comments are being received from command and control servers. And, but sometimes they just keep doing their work without being detected because they're so professionally made and so professionally directed by those people. Now, Kaspersky Labs in the front line of detecting and analysing these. How many new threats are we seeing? Every day we detect around 325,000 new malware samples. Some of them not just particularly new, they can have some sources as the ones we already know about, that they had been somehow tweaked, adjusted to suit the attacker's purpose. When we talk about the threat landscape, humans are a big part of that. How can technology help? What can technology vendors do to make sure that humans are as important in the threat detection and protection as the malware itself is? Well, I guess there's two um, fundamental things. There's what can the technology do? We can utilise things like control tools. So, for example, application control or default deny, where we can say we have a user here that only requires these 10 applications on a daily basis, so we will eliminate their ability to use any other applications. I think probably a bigger thing that we can do is to properly educate those people, make sure they understand the implications of their actions and what they should and shouldn't be doing on a daily basis. So I would argue, because uh, despite all the attempts at uh, the education, people are just that, people are susceptible to errors. 
That is the extra reason for corporate security stuff to provide different security layers that would mitigate their risks. We've talked about what's at stake for organizations in the, in the current landscape. Give me some examples of some that you've, that, that you've come across lately. Uh, have you ever heard about Carbonac? Cyber criminals who are able to, well, pump away more than one billion dollars from more than hundreds of banking industry companies. It sounds like a perfect crime. It was a great bank robbery until they were discovered by our experts. <laughs> they had some particular piece of malware to penetrate the defenses and steal part of the tool set were just regular programs uh, commercially available and parts uh, of operation system itself. One billion dollars was siphoned from over a hundred financial institutions the great bank robbery. What are the challenges that you guys face to, to stop these malware attacks, these people who are intent upon stealing money or stealing information? In the case of Carbonac, uh, all they needed to penetrate the defense, to patch some DLLs and then drop their malware and keep using just proper tools available within the system. Therefore, from that very moment, there could be nothing to detect. They already have the access, they have all the tools available in the system, so that's it. So the pragmatic approach, if you are a chief security officer, CTO, CIO, you can have as many security processes, as much security software on your site as possible, yet these attacks do happen. What will happen when you do get a data breach? Not if it happens, it's what will happen and how you can limit the damage in that case. You have to make an assumption that if there is a committed enough cyber criminal out there who is absolutely dedicated to breaching your specific defences, sooner or later they will find a vulnerability or they will find an employee who makes a mistake. Then it's about ensuring that you limit the, the ability for that, uh, that attacker to move around within your environment and limit the ability for them to take data. And that's, a, that's largely around user access and ensuring that, that you've got your own policies, your own configuration done correctly, such that me as a, as a user in my role, I have access to all of the data that I need to do that role, because you know, my employer wants me to be productive, but equally limiting me to, such that I can't access data that I don't need so that if anybody were to steal my credentials, take over my identity and get into the company, then by, by the very nature that I am limited in what I can get at, so they'll be limited. So as a, a chief security officer or information officer or technology officer, someone who's concerned and in a position of responsibility about data security in their organization, what should they do next? A lot of this is about process. So solutions, products, technologies, all important and, and can get you a whole chunk of the way. And there are a huge variety of technologies. The equally important is how those technologies are implemented, how we ensure that they dovetail together to, to provide a, a proper multi-layered defense, but also how they are then supplemented by the right security intelligence, the right data coming into your environment to keep you as up to the minute as you can possibly be, that's really where security intelligence plays a very large role. Oleg, what's your thoughts? The problem of many, many businesses is that they postpone the task of security actually. They have lots of things to do, lots of budgets to spend on important things. On their agenda, security isn't high enough, actually. The whole business process should have security as an integral part of it. But what about those companies that don't necessarily have the privilege of being able to build in IT security from the beginning of their product or the, their, their project? You know, uh, companies have got legacy IT systems, mainframes, that have been kicking around for decades and decades. What should they do? They have to begin to really understand the entire sort of topology of the environment that they're working in and then analyze 
where the potential weaknesses could be within that environment and find the right combination of intelligence, processes, products, services that they need to retrofit it. It's about doing all of the due diligence to understand the, the potential areas of exposure and then finding the right combination to address it. There is no silver bullet, as we were saying not earlier. Security is not a bit of software, it's, it's a process, it's a journey. Absolutely. What I would like to add, actually, such businesses, they usually have their hands full of un ongoing things. And therefore, if they are going to rethink their security, they need a well, right approach to it, actually. Uh, the one that would help them to, well, to make the security transition go as smooth as possible. It would be a good move to choose a vendor who would be able to fulfill their strategy uh, as fully as possible. To have it all concentrated uh, into a single point of management. Uh, with one vendor it could be possible. The majority of our products can be uh, managed centrally within a single console. Well, just imagine lots of security layers, everyone to be managed separately. Lots of consoles, lots of different approaches algorithms. It, all of them require education. It can be extremely complex for the IT staff. And Unified Solution provides companies with ability to greatly reduce the effort. And that is very helpful in case they need to rethink their security. Gentlemen, I'm afraid that's all that we've got time for right now. Uh, Oleg Gorobets and Dave Messit from Kaspersky Lab, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. We'll be back again soon. Bye-bye.